Welcome back to the Beyond the Dojo podcast. You're listening to episode four. I'm Lauren. I'm Jeremiah. And uh, the past few uh, episodes, we've been discussing stuff about application and all that jazz, because that's normally what we focus on um, with our dojos. Um, but this time, we're going to focus on something fun that has been hashed out 100 million times over, <laughs> <laughs> and it's the pros and cons of tournaments. Yeah. Um, but we're not going to get into, like, um, I think the biggest argument is about sport karate. We're not talking as much about sport karate, per se, even though we might discuss that a little bit. We're actually talking about just, like, specifically being involved in a tournament here and there. So that will kind of make sense the further along we go. Um, I know that uh, <clears throat> karate is going to be in the Olympics in 2020 in Japan. Unfortunately, that's the only time. Yeah, they already made the decision that it's not going to be break dancing. <laughs> it's going to yeah, it's going to get replaced by break dancing in the 2024 Olympics in Paris. So, yeah. um, so much for that. But you know, we'll see. I, th- I think um, it, it appears that well, well, one particular but on a style. Side note: If you watch a Mr. Giggles from France, he's a break dancer. If you want to watch someone move their body in ways that you didn't think of or can apply to karate, that's one of those guys you want to watch. I mean. I kind of picked that off of uh, Rick Hotton. He's always talking about different YouTube channels and different styles and mm-hmm. different approaches. And, you know, he's a break dancer. He can dance. He can <laughs> dance, you know. And so I'm watching – I started watching break dancing, and, and Mr. Giggles is this just ridiculously <laughs> amazing body control. And if you really enjoy body movement and uh, uh, just the whole idea of, of that kind of thing, he is amazing. So, yes, if you yes. want to give up karate and go into break dancing to compete in the Olympics, watch Mr. Giggles. Yes. That's a great name. Okay, awesome. Um, so, we're going to start this off <laughs> with okay. some fun stuff. So, let's talk about our experience with tournaments. So, we're going to talk about best and worst experience ever first, and then we'll talk about background because this will be more okay. fun. So, Jeremiah, let's start with your best experience in a tournament ever, like a specific ex- a specific experience. All right. So, um, in Japan, they, their tournaments are run different. So, you're not allowed to spar until you're in middle school. Um, Everything is done by grade and not age or weight. Um, and it's very much part of the school system. Somewhat. I mean, it's not a school activity, but they kind of run it like that's part of it. Uh, anyways, I was – it was my last year being living in Japan, living in Misawa, Japan, and it was one of my last tournaments. And it was actually the first time I got to spar. Uh, my senpai, Yuko Hazama, was, was there, and she was a corner jug. Now, Yuko, I mentioned before, was a World Kata champion, went to the JK Instructors uh, School in Tokyo, um, and she was up judging for, for this tournament. And I happened – I was I meant to do a step and punch, but somehow I tripped the guy's foot and I swept him yes. right in front of her. And I didn't know what to do, so I'm looking at her like, what the what do I do? And she looks at me like, I can't give you a point, you know, like I don't know what to do. So I just hit him as hard as I could in the chest and, and started Kiai and she stands up and gives me epo. It's like stands up. She doesn't even sit down, she just stands up. And it was the coolest thing ever because I thought like this is amazing. And it, it hooked me on to that whole idea. And that was probably my best experience. You may have only mentioned that to me like one time. I vaguely remember this story. <laughs> uh, dude, it, it, it's one of those things that, you know, it's like, I don't know. I don't think about it very much. Yeah. You know? That's pretty cool, though. It is. Especially it for a young cool. kid. Huh? Especially for a young kid. That would be super cool. It, it was so pure luck. It was unreal. <laughs> I literally thought, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to step and punch. And when I stepped and punch, I somehow... I tripped him up and didn't trip myself up. Oh, that sounds like my one of my stories. Okay. Yeah, it's serendipitous, you know. <laughs> All right, so worst experience at a tournament without um, throwing any particular organization or group under the bus, if you can help it. <laughs> um, 90, 1994 AU National Championships in Cincinnati. Uh, it was the second year they did it in a row there. Um, I was in the 15 to 16-year-old age group. Uh and we were doing kata. I did kanku sho. Everybody knows in kanku sho, the last move, last two moves is you you pivot around, you do inside form block, step and punch. I hit that kata 
way better than I ever could imagine I've done it. I was so on point. I felt so proud of myself until I went to do that last step and punch. Caught my toe in the carpet <laughs> and stumbled. I didn't lose my balance, but I stumbled big time. And it cost me the freaking, it cost me my place. I, I got fourth place out of, out of uh, 36, 37 competitors. And, oh, my God, you don't know how many times all those judges in that ring came up to me like, you know, you had it until you fell. <laughs> and Big old that feet. to me was like such – at that point in my life, I was such – I was 16, you know, 15? 15, yeah. I was 15, and I just – I was a cocky little brat, you know. I, that's all I did was train to do competition. So it just crushed me. It totally crushed me because I couldn't blame anybody but myself. And that was probably the worst. Awesome. So my best experience that I can recall would be um, <clears throat> at the Shahadi Cup in Smyrna in 2018. Um, <laughs> I was in the division with like the college age girls, and I think I was I think I was the oldest person in the division. And um, over like like just overall, the experience of sparring with those girls was really fun because they weren't they weren't overly aggressive, but they they respected the rules. They fought very hard, and I looked like an old lady because I was so out of shape. We're, like, part of the way through one of the matches, and I'm, like, dying trying to catch my breath, and they're looking at me like, what the heck is wrong with you? And I was like, I'm old. Hang on. So I'm, like, <laughs> trying to catch my breath, which is, like, way embarrassing because I teach karate and do personal training as a living, so you'd <laughs> think I'd be, like, really in shape, but I realized at that point that I really, really wasn't, so that was not cool. But overall, like, the – the um the camaraderie and like the competition everything about it was good um i did break my toe i didn't realize it at the time i didn't realize it until like the next day but i get like it still hurts to this day <laughs> but overall that was probably one of my best experiences just because overall that sparring competition as far as the girls in it and and sparring against them that was fun yeah. um worst experience was when i was 15 um <clears throat> we went to a um she's over a tournament um, it, well, it's, it was run by Shitaru Club, so the majority of the competitors were Shitaru, and um, they did their, they had added in um, Kihon to their tournament, which some tournaments do, I guess, maybe as like an icebreaker or a way to like compare competitors, maybe on a different, I'm not really sure the reasoning it. behind I... it. If you if you know why tournaments do Kihon competition, please comment it below, because I don't really understand why, but they did do it at this one. Yeah, and um, one in the local one in Florida, too. Okay, so we did we did that, uh, and then we did kata competition, and then that was it. I wasn't going to compete in um, Kamite, but we only had three people in my division because it was like teenage girls showed on and above or something, and there was only three of us, and then one of the girls had to leave to go judge, so only one of the girls was left to spar. They're like, hey, will you spar her? I'm like, okay, well, I don't have equipment. So they got me some equipment. We started sparring, and it was fine, and I like, I was winning, um, but it wasn't like, I wasn't very good at sparring. So like, it's not really anything to brag about. Um, and then the match started going long and I got to like the, we were like moving around. I was on the opposite side of the ring. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to sweep this girl and be done with it. And I wasn't very good at sweeping, but I was just going to figure it out anyway. And I remember this like picture clearly in my head. She was in front of me and she did something and came in and landed. And I had ended up shifting off to my left. So I was at her right and her right leg was forward. And I went to move in because I was going to sweep her. I was going to like do a couple of techniques and then sweep her afterwards. I didn't even do any techniques. I was in front of her. I went to move in. My knee or my leg or something hit her leg. And the next thing I know, she was on the floor. I'm like, Oh my god! I like so broke. you swept the leg. No, I didn't yeah, need to. I didn't need to. Sweep like, the leg. I stepped. Sweep the leg. I stepped in and I, uh, I thought I rolled her ankle. Like I thought maybe I stepped on her foot because I have this really bad tendency to step on people's feet, which is weird because I have like tiny feet. But um, like it was a big deal. They stopped the match. They called in an ambulance. They took her out on a stretcher. Come to find out, and I'm like crying my eyes out because I have no idea what happened. And I feel so bad because I've never done this in the tournament before, and I wasn't even supposed to be sparring. Apparently, what had happened is she had like some weird knee issue, and they claimed that her knees went out of joint easily. Like how that's even possible without a car accident or like a major like being tackled, I have no idea. But she it's wasn't. Possible if Lauren sweeps your leg. Okay, well, 
I'm just saying I barely touched her. Apparently my knee hit her on the side of the knee and it knocked her knee out of joint or it disrupted something. She wasn't wearing any knee wraps. They knew this was a problem. She wasn't wearing knee wraps. So she left in an ambulance and they gave me a gold medal. (laughs) And I felt so bad. So my older brother always thought this was the best story ever. So he would always tell everybody that I broke this girl's leg in a tournament one time when I was 15, (laughs) which was a total lie. (laughs) But anyway, that was my worst experience in a tournament. Uh So, Jeremiah, will you uh, will you give some of your background? You have way more of a tournament background than I do, so you probably have a lot more to offer on this subject. But will you just give a little bit of your background as far as tournaments? I know yeah. we talked about it in the first episode. but um, In 87, I trained in uh, the Misawa Budokan, which is the Japanese gym for martial arts in the town of Misawa, um, Aomori Prefecture, Aomori State in Japan. Uh, the dojo itself was pretty um, well-known or for to produce good kata people, um, not so much as fighters, but good good, strong kata uh, I trained there for four years. We had a strict four tournament a year um, schedule. You had a tryout to be on the, the the competition team. You had a tryout to be in kata team. You had a tryout to be in kumite team. You had no choice if you were part of the dojo. You had a tryout. Uh, I made it obviously on the competition. I made it on the competition team every time. I made it to. I never made it on the A team. I was always on the B team. Um, I think it was mainly because. I stood like a foot and a half taller than everybody in the dojo. So they didn't know what to do with me, especially in kata. It's that odd ball. Yeah. So I was always on B team. Um, I really never did well in Japan. I, I, I don't even think individually I ever placed. I never placed individually in Japan. Now our team kata got consistently second, third place, and our team kumite got about the same. Um, and then – after four years of that, I, I moved to uh, northern, um, excuse me, northern New York to Plattsburgh, New York, where uh, Thomas Froble was there, and he was part of the AJK at the time. Uh, we did a lot of AAU competitions, and I always thought I was pretty average competitor. I really didn't think I was that good at all, uh, just because of my performances over the years. It just never really did anything well. You know, I was always that third, fourth place. I never, you know, did anything individual. I started going to these AU, AAU tournaments, and I literally kid you not, I won first place Kata Kumite in every tournament for like three and a half years. Mm-hmm. The only places I didn't place or or win my division was uh, AAU Nationals. The first time I went, I was overwhelmed with nerves mm-hmm. and overwhelmed with just like the, the amount of competitors. There was 2,000 competitors at the AAU Nationals in Cincinnati. 2,000 competitors Mm -hmm. that just blew my mind and it it kind of it was hard to get over that I did a lot of uh my sensei in upstate New York believed that I should compete against anybody and everybody so I would travel with him if he had any kind of like little small teaching gigs here and there um and train with their their guys and then he would take me up into Quebec and uh you know do the Shobuipo and Kumite competitions up there. And funny funny story is, um, what is that? Okazaki's. Okazaki's a nephew. I don't know his first name, and I don't want to be disrespectful, but he's the current chief instructor of ISKF. Uh, and crazy story, man. I'm, I'm in there, and he's my second bout. I won my first one. The guy was kind of slow. The second one, he comes in, and he's, dude, he's fresh out of college, so he's like, cut small and i'm thinking oh boy this is going to be fun they said hajime and before i could even get my stance homeboy stepped in and oizukied me dead in the face <laughs> hit me and was back in kamai before i even knew what happened mm-hmm. Sho- it was ipon no doubt ipon <laughs> i was amazed by the speed yeah but anyways that's a side, a side story it was just this guy was amazingly fast yeah um other but my sensei in New York would just believe that, you know, I should compete against anybody and everybody. Uh, and that's what he did for about three and a half years. And we did, we did AU nationals, JOs, everything. Um, it got to a point where he was calling people in to bring in to train against us. Like we'd have Friday nights, which was normally our, just our black belt nights. He would call people from Burlington. He'd call people from like, um, Albany area, the the Syracuse area, and they'd come up and train with us, and it was basically beat Jeremiah up night, you know. <laughs> yeah. And it was it was every person lined up against me, and I just I had to train against him. Mm. I loved it, absolutely loved it. Mm. 
but it was it's a glimpse into how extreme you can get mm. in competition and how stupid you are sometimes. Yeah. So when you uh, when you left New York and you came to Florida, <clears throat> I know that you got involved with the UF Dojo. Did you do any tournaments down here when you were you were still like six, six, so the 17? P- problem with the JKA tournaments down in South Florida, in Florida is that they have a strict rule on competition or kumite. You have to be eighteen or older. You can't. You know they won't allow minors to compete. At that time, they wouldn't allow them to spar. You had to do kion kumite. Um. What, what was that? That was JKA tournaments? Yeah, it was JKA. It was a okay. Takashima tournament. Okay, okay, gotcha. Um, at, at, in Orlando. It, and, you know, it, it, at that time, and my pers- perspective was I wanted to fight. I wanted to spar. I was 16 years old training at the UF Karate Dojo, going against 18, 20, 22, 24-year-old guys. You know, sparring with these men and as a boy and handling handling my own, I felt like I was held back because of my age, and that was just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, so that being said, yeah, the JKA terms I really never enjoyed them in the states. They seemed to well, the ones I went to just were not what I was like liking. But at the same time, I'll say I was a pretty egotistical person at the time too. Yeah, I should have just swallowed my ego and. Did as as asked and yeah. followed the situation, but I didn't. Gotcha. Well, what about since you've been an adult? I know that you took some time off from karate and then came back. So since you've been back, how many tournaments do you think you've done? Oh, man, I don't know. Maybe. Uh... You did the first one you did was in Perry, right? Yeah, two, three, four, five, six. Maybe five or six over the last, what, ten years or so? Yeah. Over the last seven years? Yeah. Sorry. So maybe one, the one a year or so, um, and the only reason why I do that is as it's not really a competition anymore. You know, after a certain age, we all got to go to work. We all got <laughs> we got bills to pay. We got things to do. We can't be committing ourselves to this and really going at it. So in the divisions I'm in now, the, the you know the older divisions, you know, yes. the over forty divisions, um, <laughs> it's Seniors. it's just the experience. You know, to be able to spar someone you don't know. And really not care if you punched them too hard. Yeah. You know? And that's kind of why I did a lot of the tournaments then, was just to enjoy that kind of opportunity. Because in, in the dojo, you know, majority of the time, the last two dojos I've been a part of are, are been majority kids. So there's no training for adults. Gotcha. Not like that. Gotcha. So. Okay. Well, my <clears throat> my tournament background is extremely limited. Um, so when I was, uh, probably 11, maybe 10 or 11, um, <clears throat> our dojo had been involved a little bit in the AAU tournaments in Florida. Um, uh, there's, I don't want to c- call out any names because it doesn't really matter, but my sensei knew some other guys that would put on tournaments and stuff. So <clears throat> we, um, we would go over to Tarpon Springs and we would go to AU Regionals. And that was a huge tournament. I don't know how many competitors there were, but it was a huge Methodist church and the place was packed. And the tournament lasted all day long. And your each division had at least 25, 30 competitors. I mean, so my very first tournament, that's how that was. And it, it was terrifying. Um, first tournament was like Kata and I like lost the first round. And I was like, I, had, I think I went into that with a little bit of an ego because in my dojo, I was a pretty decent student like my karate was pretty good so to walk into a tournament and immediately lose I was like what I lost mm-hmm. so so it, it definitely was humbling um and that actually uh that was a that's, that's been a bit of a pattern especially for kata for me mm-hmm. never usually placed very well um and then uh, I didn't I didn't do any uh sparring I maybe did the second year or third year um but I think we did tournaments for like three years and then there were some issues because I don't know, the the adults felt like there were certain groups that were being favored, and I was like, whatever, I didn't really know. I was like 12, 13, 14 years old, so I was like, okay, forget it. And then and then um, soon after that was the time I went to the Shitoru tournament. So after I um, accidentally dislocated this girl's knee or whatever it was, um, I didn't go into another tournament for like eight years because I was like, I can't, I don't want to do that again. Like, if that's what this is going to be, where people are, honestly, she's a little irresponsible. I was like, this is just dumb. So, um I didn't go to a tournament again, again until I was in my 20s, and it was um, the tournament was was pretty well run. And then um, only tournaments recently have been like um, there's a Kinkajuku tournament 
up in um, the armpit of Florida, <laughs> up in Perry, yeah. um, that we go to, uh, we've gone to once, we might go to again, and then yeah. um, the Shahadi Cup. Um, yeah, Jimmy Bowden and those guys up there are good people, man. Yeah. They always run a good good tournament. Everything's fair, quick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's nice, man. That's one thing I got to I gotta say about the tournaments lately is they've been always well ran. Mm-hmm. Back in the day when I was a kid, man, it yeah. was normal to run to 5, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock at night when you yeah. start at 9 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, well, it seems like so. more and more people who are running tournaments are realizing, like, it takes a long time. People get bored. They you don't want to sit at your tournament all day long and get it done. Yeah. Um, and, and we've been involved in the Shuhadi Cup, Shuhadi Cup the past two years, and that was that's yeah. a very well-run tournament, and, I, and I've enjoyed that. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it as far as tournament history. There's really yeah. nothing there for me. <laughs> I would say that the Shoddy Cup, uh, for individuals who enjoyed that old school JK tournament style, the old, um, the little bit harder tournaments, you know, Shobu Ipon, Shobu Sambo kind of thing, where it's a little bit more rough, mm-hmm. um, that's a good tournament to go to. The, the, the judging is fair. The tournament runs well. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, it's going to be in Minnesota this uh we're just like plus. plugging this away, even though Amy Sperling and Scott Park didn't, didn't ask us to do this. No, no, <laughs> but no, no, it's no. going to be awesome. Dude, it's going to be fun. Uh, I know a couple of guys, a guy coming up from Alabama, you know, it, to me, it's that whole, like, you, you compete, but you're having a good time. You're not, you're not trying to be a world champion. Yeah. And there's going to be a lot of adults at this tournament. Too, yeah. And that's too, it's fun. predominantly an adult tournament. So that's even better. Yeah. That's, that's kind of nice. Okay, so let's get into um, pros and cons. And I know that people really rag on tournaments and like tournaments yeah. suck, but we're going to try to stick with the positive stuff first and then we'll rant and rave later. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'll say one good thing and you say one good thing. Okay. So for me, I think one good thing for tournaments for myself or for my students is mental toughness through those nerves. So anytime you're you're going through any kind of competitive thing or any any stressful situation where you're being like, put to the test. Um, if you're able to persevere through that and develop some mental toughness, um, and just get the job done, then you have, you've gained something from that. Even if, um, you know, you didn't get a medal or you did get a medal, whatever. Um, I know that, um, I have, I've done well, you know, in pressured situations like that, even if it wasn't karate related. And I know that I've developed from it. So that's one good thing I would say, like for our students, that it yeah. would be good to encourage them to do that for yeah. just because they, they do develop those good qualities. I guess I would say the first, the, the first thing that I think is positive or pro of tournaments is, you know, you actually get to test your karate. Yeah. You actually get to test it um, against people you don't know. Mm-hmm. And, People judge you. You generally, well, you'll eventually meet them. If you do a lot of tournaments, you'll know who who everybody is. Mm -hmm. But at first, if you just do one or two, you don't even know the judges. So they don't even, you don't have a relationship there. And it's always good to hear an honest opinion. Maybe you might not respect it, but it's good to hear it. Mm -hmm. So I would say that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm getting to, yeah, have that judge. Um, Just have that test, you know, that feeling. Yeah, sorry. I knew that I wrote down something similar, so I'm going (laughs) to try to find it on here so that I don't say it again. Um, I think it's funny she has notes and still loses them. Whatever. All right. Well, <laughs> gonna say, I'm just going to go in order then of what I wrote down. How about that? Whatever. Um, the other thing is that it gives you a goal to shoot for. Yeah. So, like, if you if you need a training goal, because, like, obviously karate is, like, this never-ending journey where you're always trying to get better. But having those small goals along the path can be helpful if you don't have, like, a specific. Right. That motivation factor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't have, like, a, a specific goal as far as your own training, if you're able to shoot for something like, hey, I'm training for this specific, specific yeah. thing, um, whether it's a test or, in this case, a tournament, sometimes I think that helps. And, um you know, it's always nice to have a goal. I think, um, the, I think the further along we go and the longer we train, hopefully it's easier for us to set our own goals or at least know ourselves well enough to know if we need a goal, I guess. Um, with, with our students, um, I think it will be good just to give them that little bit of competition. We mentioned, I mentioned this in one of the previous podcasts, uh, the students that I have look, if, if parents or students are listening to this, don't be offended because it's the truth. A lot of our students don't play other sports. So a lot of them come to us <laughs> and they don't really have a lot of competition. So sometimes providing that for them um, can be helpful and give them some kind of a goal to shoot for, something to train for. That way they can get some tangible feedback for, for their training other than me saying, hey, bend your knee all, right. all the time. <laughs> I, I think you, you already touched on the, the whole like mental toughness. Yeah. But I think that includes like the whole idea of like ha- handling stress 
seeing the solution, mm -hmm. working through a problem, not losing your cool. All that is that mental toughness, you know, that, that Joe yeah. cool attitude where you're just always in control. Yeah. Well, that's, and that's even like when you're sparring and stuff too, because oh, yeah. stuff gets like, all stuff, out of whack. stuff gets crazy when you're sparring and we can both say from recent experiences that sometimes we don't keep our cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here we go. Quick recap. I'll tell mine. You tell yours. Go ahead. Okay. So went to a tournament and ended up having to spar a teenager um, because there were no adults. And um, she hit me after Yame and I lost it and got really, really mad. <laughs> so I looked at that girl. I almost took my mouth. I was walking. There's a video of me like walking toward her and I'm about to take my mouthpiece out and scream in her face. But I put it back in and walked back over to my <laughs> mark because, look, I, I don't get to fight much, but I got... I got fossil blood in me. All right. We're, we're angry people. And, um, anyway, the next bout, um, yeah, I clocked her. Yeah. It was really loud and it was kind of awesome. Well, I feel really bad now because it, she's a kid. And if I had had no gloves on, I probably would have knocked her out. Yeah. Yeah. It was bad. But anyway, yeah. um, that was not me handling. It. <laughs> handling that was it. not mental toughness at all. That was me giving in to being angry. I was, my only thought was I will bury you child. <laughs> yeah. So I guess mine was, um, I come from an old school background. So when you're sparring me, if you ever, ever turn your back to me, I will lose my shit. <laughs> I will absolutely lose my shit and go after you. Are we allowed to cuss on this? Oh, yeah, maybe. I'm sorry. I'll lose my stuff. And <laughs> and basically, I was at a tournament. The guy came in. He smacked. He cuffed me in the ear. That was, yeah. That was and, and it kind of stunned me. And when it stunned me and I looked up, he had turned around and had walked away from me. Well, it wasn't just that because you guys continued spraying on later. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I lost it. So I cha I ran across the the. the the ring and try to land a punch. I was hoping I could land it. I missed mm -hmm. and they called Yame, but dude, I can't stand it when someone turns their back to me. It just, it just drives me nuts. What he's not saying is that a couple rounds later, he knocked the guy out cold and it was hilarious. And I'm sorry if you're listening to this and you know that it's you, <laughs> but it, you should have been disqualified for it. But it, the guy did run into the, Punch the, according to the but I, I I should not have been disqualified for that jab. That jab was well timed. <laughs> it was very well timed. well timed. And on video, I have video evidence. We met. He was moving in. I was moving in. Okay. We met. I just happened to get the better of it. Yes. That's all. So that's that's not mental toughness on our part. Oh so gosh, we're no, not that's, very that's good that's examples of mental of, toughness. Uh, you know, it's just it's we're angry people, things, man. It's weird, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like. Uh, like, in my family, in the Hart family, mm -hmm. if you were to smack us in the face, like, open hand smack us in the face, mm -hmm. we would try to rip your your, your larynx <laughs> out. You know, we would just absolutely try to kill Sounds you. Sounds like my family. Oh right? My but good. you could turn we're around good. and close your hand mm -hmm. and punch us and give us bloody nose and break our bones, and we would still be like, eh, oh, he didn't mean that, you know, and give him that, that other cheek. Yeah. It's just something about like certain things that set me off. Yeah. And one of them is when you turn your back in the ring, I just feel so disrespected. Yeah. That I just I lose it. Yeah. And and for that millisecond I'm like, I'm gonna get you. Yeah. I cool down afterwards. Yeah. But after that millisecond, I'm after you. So Yeah. Dude, that girl, like she she gave me she didn't black my eyes. She gave me a bruise on the side of my eye. <laughs> she my black your eye. See, my my <laughs> problem my problem is that I like I process information so quickly that like he said Yame and I was like, Oh, disengaging, pulling back, and she just went wham and I was like, Oh no. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, anyway, let's move on from that. Okay. So um mental toughness. Uh maybe it gives you mental toughness because apparently we don't have it. Okay, maybe that's a negative part. Um, and it's supposed to test your sparring in a controlled environment, but yeah. you know, we, we yeah. kind of, of the awareness, just like yeah. your peripheral vision, stuff like that. The being aware of something, the, the comfort level of, of, in a, of being in a fight. I mm -hmm. mean, if you look at martial arts and as a self-defense art, then you have to look at conditioning yourself to be ready for a fight. And the only way to do that is be in fights. And to not be standing there in front of the person who you're sparring against and not be able to catch your breath. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> 
Um, uh, it's not to like lose your mind either. Yes, that's true. Exactly. Um, the last one I think we have on our list is it's giving another judgment for your technical and, and kata ability. Yeah. Um, so now, well, okay. So there's two, there's two sides to this though, because what well, one is, okay. In sparring, you do have, there is some technical feedback because if your techniques are poor, a good judge is not going to give you right. points for that. But in kata, um, and we'll, this, we'll this is going to go positive and negative. Yeah. Well, so it, it does give another judgment as far as your kata ability. So there's other the people gift, on looking. Yeah, the gift of being in a tournament is that you get thick skin. Yeah, that's true. That's because sometimes you know the person that's giving you commentary or mm. or whatever. They can't do what they're saying you to do. They're not. They're telling you things to do that they personally cannot do themselves. Yeah. And you could look at them and go, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. man. And you have to be. You know, you have to have good sportsmanship and everything else. And you're trying to be polite, but sometimes you just want to tell them to stick it. You know. <laughs> yeah, but but you do learn. You, you learn, you have to have thick skin and thick learn, skin. like, you know what? It's just a tournament and you learn. It, the other good thing is, like, okay, so if there's you a. If segment it, you get, like. Yeah, yeah, you can you can separate yourself separate from it. Yourself. I, I think um, if, if there's a complaint about um, <clears throat> kids not learning how to lose and just be right. losers and, exactly. and just accept that you're not always going to win, tournaments are a good way to do that because even people who are really good will freaking lose sometimes. If, yeah. if you walk into a tournament where no one knows you especially and they're not giving you any benefit of the doubt, it's a good chance you could probably lose. Yep. And the other thing is that it's luck of the draw. It's totally luck of the draw when you walk in, who you end up against. We were actually talking to a guy um, at our black belt class yesterday, and he was saying that he went to a tournament, and uh, first round, he lost. Lost first round. The guy that beat him got first place. Got first place. He's like, well, what does that make me? It doesn't matter. It was a tournament. That's what happened that day. And it, well, actually, let's, let's talk about this real quick. So the reason I wanted to talk about this is um, last month we put we, – we put this is the second year we've put on an in-house tournament – for our kids and we did um jeremiah's kids from his dojo uh, my kids from my dojo and then we actually invited over a, a chitaru dojo from um orlando and they brought a couple kids over yeah gordon's group yeah gordon gordon um so that was that was that's been very fun um and now we throw other cool things in there like a barbecue afterwards and we had a pool party and stuff yeah. but the tournament itself um like we keep it small right. and it's only kata and team kata so we're, we haven't done any sparring i maybe one day we will right now we've we've decided against that um we host it in my dojo and my my dojo is young and has a lot of young students a lot of white belts and so this was this is kind of a way to intro um tournaments to them and um man the feedback from it though was was really good i mean yeah. those kids they they trained very hard yeah, their they technique tried. was really good yeah yeah, I was I was very impressed. So I mean, that was that was a really good experience for them to get to get into the tournament feel without yeah. it being overwhelming. I was gonna say that's a great great way for other dojo heads to figure out how to int introduce competitive competitive karate yeah. to your dojo without being it overwhelming and at the same time being a negative experience. Yeah, and the other thing too is like if your turn if if you're trying to make your dojo not a sport dojo like if you don't want that to be the focus right i think doing something like this is nice because it gives them a feel for what that's like without it becoming a part of your everyday life or your everyday training right it doesn't become that obsession yeah absolutely all right do we talk about the negative things now yep, let's do all it. right let's rip the band-aid off all right so um you say a negative thing first you be mr negative first I'll just say it this way. It's the luck of the draw. The whole scheme, the whole structure of tournaments in itself is not fair. Yeah. And that's hard for someone who's going to their first tournament because yeah. they practice and you, you're prepared no matter what to get to do well. Mm -hmm. And you might only get one chance and it might be that's it. One and done, mm -hmm. you know, and for an, a brand new experience, that's horrible. That's not they'll never want to really do that again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not like a team sport where you're just playing for, like, an hour and right. you basically get to, to try over and over again. It's right. pretty much... You prepare for a you're, month. Yeah, you're months. either judged one time and you're done, or you spar once and... Once I'm done, yeah. Dead. So yeah. I would say the, just the, the nature of a tournament isn't fair, and mm -hmm. that's probably one of the one of the cons for me. Biggest is, drawbacks. I wish it was a little bit more... A better way of... A better system. Yeah. I don't know how to... Because, you know, there's been organizations that try to do it, like the uh, 
the gymnastics and, and everything is cued and everything has a certain standard. The problem with that is that with different styles and different emphasis is you're, you're eliminating a lot of different kind of people. You can't have a open style kind of tournament because your standards might not match the standards of another style. So there's that whole problem. But anyways. Yeah, well, that's, tr- that's I think that's what yeah. the WKF has tried to, like, standardize, I'm, I'm, but it's dude, not I'm rabbit trailing all over the place today. Um, so one big issue that I have experienced and that I have seen is that Kata is judged on stylistic preference. Mm-hmm. So not just, like, what style of karate you do, but, like, how you actually do your karate, right. how you do your stances. Um, how much noise you make every time you take a step, how hard you stomp into the floor or don't, um, how you distribute your weight, your timing of your movement, how quickly you move, all of those things. There's, then there's probably way more than I'm even thinking about. A stylistic preference. So it can be very difficult depending on the background that you have. You know, if you have very, mm, well, this is going to sound like I got an axe to grind, but I feel in a lot of cases, if you have very efficient or like not as flashy karate, you don't do as well in a lot of tournaments. That's just, that's just an observation. Yeah. Well, I'll say this. When you do tournament karate, you have to do tournament karate. Yeah. It's like playing baseball. You follow the rules. Mm -hmm. So that being said, um, that's a con because now what you have is, a martial art that's purely dance. There's real no meaning behind it. It's purely aesthetic. And that becomes a separate thing from like the application stuff we talked about or regular traditional karate where you're training for a purpose. So the requirements to do well are completely different. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go into a tournament accepting that and knowing that that's what the norm is, Mm -hmm. then it's not a bad thing. Yeah. Once in a while. Yeah. Well, so uh, on the on the subject of judging kata, I mean, we've been to tournaments where you know, I'm I'm being I'm a sandan being judged doing nijushiho, and the judge is a brown belt, and I'm like, you don't know nijushiho. What do you ha- What do you know about the kata versus yeah, but somebody see, that's else? <laughs> the thing most people think you have you're getting judged on the the exact moves and technical aspects of the kata. In reality, all tournaments have turned into a performance based judge. Yeah. They're pre- they're judging the way you perform. Yeah. Now this is something that we're viewing as a con because not, yeah, not how accurate your karate is yeah. or um, practical or effective. It's all about the performance. Yeah. Like I said before, though, if you accept that, mm-hmm. it's not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. But it is a con to a tournament because it changes your perspective. It changes how you practice. It changes, changes the way you It perform. changes what you think is good. Yeah. Everything about it. Yeah. Because now it's all about the shape. And y'all, we love, you know, we're about function over form. Well, they both have its place, but sure. But like not form, like where it's just a shape and that's all there is yeah, to there's it. Yeah, no, no, yeah, there's this function form thing compared to just form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's uh, you know, uh, the the kata thing like really irks me. Yeah, I just, yeah. And the same with kumite too, because the judges, if they're they have a, a slow eye, uh, if they're not focused in, or or what they think is good is you know their preference. And once again, their preference is going to influence what they what they score. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's. Weird. I'll say this to those who have ever who are considering doing a tournament, just. Except that you're going to Billy's yard and you're paying by Billy's rules. Mm-hmm. But be confident in what you do. So be confident in your kata. Be confident in your karate. And take the experience for what it is, just an experience, mm-hmm. not an end-all or absolute. I think sometimes people go to tournaments and think, oh, this is this is what they say is right and that's it. There's no other way. Mm-hmm. And, and it's well, well, guess what, Billy? It may be your tournament, but I'm still going to sit here and complain because <laughs> my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, well, a couple other things about Kamite, though, is like, um, so some specifics, like points that should be scored aren't scored. Like people, some there are times when people do yeah. effective techniques, those points are not scored, but then you have this tag bull crap and people get scored That's... for it. It's like, what? Yeah. I, sometimes I wonder if these judges have ever actually been in a real fight. 
did you have a sibling that you like punched in the face when he followed you in your room or something? Cause like I did. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if they've ever seen like, <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and once again, it's an athletic event. It's a tournament and you know, the judge, the judges majority of the time are not going to be the greatest. Uh, it's hard for people to be idealistic about a tournament because everybody thinks it's going to be this ideal setting. And it's not, dude. it's tainted. It's yeah. always will be. Yeah. It's never going to be absolutely fair. Yeah. So, but the, I guess the cons of this, we're, when you go to a tournament, you're putting what people think of your karate in mm-hmm. the hands of people you don't know. Yeah. And that's just, and when that happens, man, sometimes you get lucky and you got like minded people, and then sometimes you got some people that completely opposite, you know? Yeah. The con is that. The con also is the fact that it is it change it skews what karate is so bad or so much that it's not really karate anymore. It's mm-hmm. it's sport, literally sport karate. It, it's a yeah. whole different thing. Yeah. So 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 looking at the good and the bad that come from it, um, let's talk about how we personally would prep or would allow our students to prep or how we would involve this in our dojo atmosphere or like how we do it. So I have a young dojo and we haven't actually taken anybody to a tournament before, except for one of our senior adult students. Um, But I know that you've had students go to tournaments before in the past, right? Mm -hmm. So how did you handle like prepping for that tournament and all that stuff? Uh, So when I was growing up in Japan, and, and Misawa, uh, you know, the, the tournament prep was, was hardcore. It was three months or two to three months beforehand. And we already knew what team we were on. We already knew what we were doing, what kata we were working on. Mm-hmm. And it was a lot of repetition, mm-hmm. just a lot of repetition. Um, if the child or student is privileged enough to be on team, kumi, uh, team kata and do individual kata, mm-hmm. and they're doing the same kata, Mm-hmm. then you, what you do is you focus on team kata because you're getting two birds with one stone. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how I would encourage that situation. When I'm prepping children who are just doing individual things, mm-hmm. uh, I generally make sure they get at least 10 reps of the kata, mm-hmm. at mm-hmm. least. And then at least if they're doing kumite, it's about the same amount of time, so 30 minutes or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have an hour, hour, 15 minute class, you can, you usually do about 35 minutes each and you're fine. Yep. Uh, if you have an hour and a half, it's perfect. Cause then you do 30, 30, and 30, mm-hmm. that's 30 kata, 30 kumite and 30 conditioning, always doing conditioning. Cause like Lauren just said, and, and I can attest <laughs> to also is if you're not in condition, man, you'll lose your win so quickly and that's it. You're done. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, one other thing that I'll add, and this is, this is something maybe just to think about for my preference and my own pride, um, I will never change my kata or my performance based on the way that I'm going to be judged a specific tournament, especially if I go to a tournament and I know that they're looking for a specific thing, like something that I wouldn't normally do. I don't, I am not going to change for that. But if, if competition is important to you, it's important that you pay attention to what those things are so that you can add those things in. If you want to win, that is how you win. You play by their rules. Like Jeremiah was harping on me for earlier, but (laughs) I am too prideful to change what I am doing. (laughs) So I'll say this. Um, when it gets to that point where a child wants to commit to training more and traveling, huh? Adult too. Uh, well, a student, a student, yeah. Who wants to commit to training and traveling and, and really get on that road? The dog just farted. Oh, God. <laughs> Nasty. <laughs> so, like I was saying, um, <laughs> trying to breathe. If, if the student is committed to a higher level of competition where they want to go national, regional, national, international kind of stuff. Then the approach completely changes. Uh, yeah. Everything is about the shape. Everything is about uh, conditioning and, and being a better athlete. Because right now, the current status quo for karate athletes is that they're really good athletes. They're well conditioned, well coordinated, uh, strong. Um, but their karate technique is nice looking, but their movement kind of iffy. Mm-hmm. And and well, 
that is the current thing, then that's what we kind of have to mold our our competitors to be. Yeah. Because if they want that, they want to be successful, then we have to provide that thing. Um, but I will say this. When it comes to kata, I will allow the student to have artistic interpretation and certain things like pauses, ki uh certain areas. I'll let that happen. Without them doing like 100 ki it doesn't mean yeah, that. Yeah, as long as it's not overly done. There's not, a limitation not, to, to their, their freedom. Yeah, they're not like changing the kata. They're not or, changing the kata. Okay. They're not changing the, te- uh, the groupings or tempo. Um, maybe a little bit more flashy in their slow moves and a little bit more flashy in their kicks. I'm okay with that because that's what they're getting judged on. Mm. Um, but to actually, you know, make a slow move into a slow move and a long pause, I'm not okay with that. Mm-hmm. So there's that kind of thing. See, Grandma is like, oh, you want to do tournaments? Let me help you. I'm like, no, we're not changing anything. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I, mean, I Honestly, I believe that tournaments have a great spot in the karate, they in do. development of karate. Yeah, they do. And, and it creates and develops children and students into a more well-rounded karate because they understand the situations a little bit better. They understand pressure a little bit better. Um, Especially if you're not getting it in your own dojo enough, it is yeah, good to have exactly. that experience. Plus, it challenges those students that tend to rise to the top anyways. They're natural athletes. Yeah, uh, so you give them they, somebody else. Yeah, they, so you give them... I, I saw something the other day that was... that was, uh, it was pretty amazing. It says you, must, you should always have a, a rival. Mm. That a rival... You should... If you don't have a rival, go find one mm. because you need that person to constantly push you forward to beat them. Yeah. And it's crazy because when I saw that, I had a rival in, in upstate New York. Yeah. I had a kid that was, before I showed up, was the guy. Mm-hmm. And then when I showed up, I was the guy. He didn't like that. Yeah. So when we met up and we sparred or we did kata, it was on. Yeah. Because it wasn't about that stupid medal. It was about, I'm better than you. It's funny because that, that, that very first tournament, that girl that beat me, yeah. she won the whole tournament. Yeah. She won our division. And I never forgot her name. I'm not going to say her name in case somebody knows her. But I I never forgot her. And I saw her again the next year. But that was always the person on my mind was this girl that beat me at this tournament. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no way. <laughs> yeah. And and that's the thing, though. It, there, you should have a rival. Yeah. You should have a nemesis. You should It should push you forward. Yeah. And I think tournaments give you that opportunity within karate. <laughs> Unless you're blessed to have a, a really big dojo that has a lot of kids that are competitive, mm-hmm. you know, where they just push each other and they have that community that does that. Yeah. Most dojos aren't that way. Unless you're just really motivated by not having a rival or. <laughs> yeah. Like no, this. no. I think it's good to have a rival. I think it's good to develop your job. I think it's good to have, give them a purpose and motivation and, and a goal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's great for them to learn that not all goals are achievable. Yeah. And that failure is part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And failure can be part of something that you have no control over. Mm-hmm. It yeah. might not be your fault. Yeah. And that's a lesson to be learned through competition. Yeah. So I completely support that idea. Yeah. Up until a certain point. Yeah. Once it becomes an obsession, once it becomes this thing where it just completely engulfs you and changes not only the way you look. Mm-hmm but the way you handle and talk to people and the, the, it affects your ego and your personality, then it's a whole different story. Yeah. And a lot, what I hate to see or say is you can see it in a lot of the elite karate athletes. You can see they have this arrogance to them or this cockiness to them. And it's like, but you're supposed to be humbled by karate. Yeah. You're not supposed to be arrogant with it. Yeah. So. And you know, have you ever been in a real fight? <laughs> I just, no, I'm, I'm not I'll, trying to be a I'll jerk. I'll say this. When I was at UF, um, right before I stepped away from karate, I had a, a big mouth, and I got into a fight downtown, and I swear to you, I gave him the best e-bone I ever gave anybody. I hit him so damn good and pulled back my hikite, and I thought I was good, and then I got my ha- ass handed to me. Yep. And a dude just beat me senseless. Yeah. And that was part of the reason why I stepped away. Yeah. 
Well, let's see. This is and that's good because like so tournaments are a teaching tool for right. certain things, but then, then you, you get back realize. into like okay, real life. Right. It's not going to be controlled. You're not going to be if he, if it was a real life situation. You're not going right. to be sparring another karateka. It's going to be somebody who's going to grab and throw and bite and Absolutely. scratch and all this crazy stuff. So that becomes a different story. So I'm like, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but like, have they ever been in a real fight? I'm not encouraging yeah. people to go get fights, but seriously, you have to consider have to real, consider real life. If you're going to start applying your karate and that's yeah. where it loops back around to what we talked about the past three weeks. Yeah. Well, yes. that thing too is, you know, I think the hard part with, with karate nowadays, you know, when it first started out, it was looked at as purely as a self-defense art. And then it morphed into this thing that was like purely sport karate. Yeah. Late 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s and on, right? Yeah. Um, the problem is everybody limits karate to one thing or another. Yeah. And we need to go ahead and just accept that karate is a multifaceted thing. Mm-hmm. And we could use those things like a tool. Yeah, absolutely. And just kind of, you know, use it and accept it for what it is and respect it for what it is. Yeah. But if you're past that point, don't use that tool anymore. Yeah. And like, see, that's what, that's kind of, I guess, maybe the point that we're getting at with, with talking about tournaments is like, we're using it as a tool, despite the fact that we're trying to run dojos and trying to train in such a way that our our karate is applicable. We're still using tournaments, good tournaments to, to help further that in ourselves and in our students. So we're not saying that we, we do sport karate separate from regular karate. We're using this, like you said, as a tool to help develop ourselves and our students, students, you know, certain things that certain characteristics that they need either in their personality or in their. All right. Plus it's just, it's, it's good. You're a good teacher when you provide the avenues that your students want, you know, need. and need. Yeah. Well, not, you're a good. You're a great teacher if you provide what they need. Yes. <laughs> Let's be real. Yes. But if you're a good I teacher, if you if you're out able to give these different avenues and let them try it out for themselves and figure out what karate means to them. Absolutely. You know, and that's I guess our our thing is we don't we don't absolutely support everything. Yeah. But we encourage a lot. Mm-hmm. more than what people think you know we will encourage people to, tr- to compete because like lauren said it just makes you a better karateka yeah it kind of shows you the limitations of it but you at least get the experience so that you if you Absolutely. if you if you want to have the audacity to say i hate tournaments well you have a reason to say it the because you actually it, you actually exactly. did them so it is good to compete at some point yeah. okay so um recap with the shuhari cup I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug it in it there is, again. It's gonna be awesome. It is I'm awesome. gonna put it in the in the, the description box link below. Right now we're still just on YouTube, so yeah. um, you can go there and check it out. And um, it's gonna be in Minneapolis in late July Absolutely. 2020, and it's gonna be uh, off the chizzing. The Kitsune Jojo is is hosting it, and they always do those guys up there do an amazing job. They do. They, they, they always have everything together. It's all well organized. It's ran smoothly. Mm-hmm. Everything is covered. Uh, anytime we traveled up to Minneapolis, man, the those guys took care of us. Yeah. There was never a moment where we were in need or, you know, just felt like we're out of place. Romance. We love you guys. <laughs> okay. Um, so last bit. Um, so this time I actually remember because I wrote it uh, down. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Jeremiah, what are you working on? Uh, I'm still working on step and punch, but I feel like I made some headway. Uh, really keeping my weight on top of my driving heel and, and trying to control the extension of my leg. I figured I'll take one and, and do it so much to where it becomes second nature. I kind of know what I'm doing without having to feel it mm-hmm. so that I could practice on the other and try to time it together. I figured I need one to be controlled or one to have somewhat experience with before I try to coordinate two things. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So... Um, I'm actually working on something similar. I'm working on step and punch also, um, but also um, stepping in um, my Yeti Oizuki, like kind of building off of that. So with the step and punch, the biggest thing I worked on this weekend was not just the heel down thing, but um, trying to working trying to work on not allowing my body to sway side to side and instead go in a straight line whenever I step forward. But also, um, it was pointed out to me that I tend to overarch my back and kind of lean backwards. So I'm trying to actually translate my thoracic cage forward so it's right over my hips and I can better engage my... She meant abdominals. rib cage. That's what that is. For layman, Just it's look called it up, cage. okay? Use Google. That's why you have Google, all right? 
Um, yes, <laughs> it's, it's a better engage my abdominals, but also, um, it takes a lot of the pressure off my back because my back's been hurting. Um, but I feel like it stops that weird hiccup thing that I had mentioned that I was working on with my hips. Um, and then also working on controlling that same general stuff with that and my root leg on front kick Oizuki. So not, not overturning that floor foot out to the side instead trying to keep it straight forward as long as possible when front kicking and not overextending my technique. So I did that yesterday and today. Yep. Okay. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, we did get some requests for um, topics. So if you have additional, I mean, we're going to cover one of those next week. If you have any additional requests or things you'd like to hear us chat about, feel free to drop it in the comments below or send one of us a message. Um, we're both on Facebook by our regular names, Lauren Hart and Jeremiah Hart. We're also on Instagram. Uh, Jeremiah is Shotokan Karate Family Fitness. I am Shotokan KHP and also Lauren Hart Athletics. So either one of those, you can hit us up. And peace. See y'all next week. Thank you next. See you next week. Yes. Thank you next week. Thank Bye. you next week. Thank you. Come again.